What's going on, guys? Welcome back to uh, Beyond the, uh, the uh, Beret, right? So today I have Taylor Cavanaugh, right? Am I pronouncing that right? You are. All right, awesome. So I came across him on YouTube, guys. He is an ex-Navy SEAL, currently serving with the Legion. And he's, you know, he's kind of like me, right? Where, like, no bullshit, straight to the point, just in your face, giving you raw feedback, whether you want to hear it or not. And that's the type of man that we need nowadays. We're the type of people that these younger kids need to emulate, right? So I figure I reached out to him, get him on the podcast, and just chronicle his story to hopefully help you guys, right? Give you guys something to uh, listen to and someone else to look up to, right? With all that said, Taylor, I appreciate you coming on, brother. Jay, thanks for having me, and thank everybody for listening in. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Like I said, man, you got a, a you definitely have a following for, um, you know, because Dude, I don't think you've been on there long. Like, I, I came across your channel, what, about two, three months ago? Yeah, five weeks, bro. Yeah, five, six weeks. It's my sixth week. I uploaded my first video. Dude, that's awesome, man. And you're already blowing up. That just speaks to, you know, how how hunger folks are to hear folks like you. And well I said. Well them. said, yeah. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, like, you see all these guys – on social media talking about how tough they are and how badass they are. But in reality, they really haven't done anything, right? The ultimate test, as far as through my lens, or a dude that actually, you know, joins the military and goes to battle, you know, to represent what he stands for, right? Like, to me, that's the ultimate warrior, the ultimate dudes that need to be idolized, right? Not just these random, you know, celebrities that make movies and act tough and guys automatically put him on a pedestal. Oh, that's a badass dude. I'm like, this dude hasn't done anything. He's, he's been active. You know what I mean? Man, we got to – and that's kind of what we're changing, Jay. We're, cha we're rewriting the script, right, by putting out – because this is kind of a new genre, man. What, we're, what you and I are kind of doing, Jay, is it hasn't really been done before because the guys before us who we respect, who we stood on the shoulders of, you know, their reputation in the Green Beret community and in the SEAL community – Man, they didn't have social media and shit, you know? It didn't really exist. And then we went through this period where it was hush-hush. That quite, you know, you can't say anything about it, man. But there's a difference between OPSEC and, and social important information. And trying to hide who we are and our backgrounds is doing nobody a service. It's, it's who we are. It's not even a job. It's a calling. So it not, not mentioning it is doing us a disservice and it's doing the people because the content of the information is important, but the context is as important, Jay. Like, just like you said, your people are emulating these faux stars and I'm not, you know, more power to them, you know, making money and do, but who should, who should our younger generation be idolizing? And I'm not saying idolize me or idolize special force, but guys that have some social proof that have, strapped up and got after it when it was time yeah and that's an awesome way to put it man and that was one of the the struggles that i had as i was retired because i retired five years ago after well five months ago um after a 20 year stay and i was shit i had that struggle i was like man like i you know came from underneath a rock and now my eyes are open and i'm seeing the lay of the land as far as where society's going I'm mm -hmm. like, man, I got to do something about this. But then I also had the the stigma from the special operation community of staying hush-hush and silent and yeah. professionals and all of that. And finally, man, I was like, you know what? I'm invested in this. I have yes. a son and I have a daughter, you know, a five and a three-year-old. And I'm like, if I don't do this for them, then I'm, I'm failing them, right? It's my job to make sure that, one, if something was to happen to me, they do have this content to fall back on so they can see you know, how I move and how, and what I did. And two, it'll give not only him a guideline, but also his peers, right? As they're growing up, they can see, oh, these are what, like being a man is all about. These are the principles. These are the characters. This is what I should be emulating, right? And not the stars and the singers and the basketball players and the football players. Like that's not where it's at, man. So I'm glad you and I see how to eye, man. This should be an awesome conversation. Yeah, brother, because if the only content getting put out is that cupcake world and all the meat eaters are being hush hush, what, where's the vacuum? You know, there's a vacuum and it's going to get filled with information. 
Yeah. Now we can drive what information is filled or we can just sit back and just let it happen. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I agree 100 percent. With all that said, man, we'll jump right into your story, man. I know it's an interesting one. Like I've been following it on your channel um, and it's comical and it's raw and it's right in your face, man. I love it. So we'll we'll uh, uh, go all the way back to the beginning, man. Let's uh, talk about where you're from. Uh, how'd you grow up and what led you to joining the United States military? Man, or, you know, right? man I, I grew up in San Diego, California. My, my pops was a Marine, not a career guy, you know, six in and out, but he worked on, he was, uh, you know, a crew on Chinooks and there used to be an old Marine base in like El Toro, Orange County. It's now, it got demolished and now it's condos, right? Cause you know, this was the late eighties. And so yeah. that, that area was a lot different than it is now. And that land got real expensive. Mm -hmm. And so the government sold it, turned it into condos, but I used to live on that Marine base. And when my dad got out, we stayed in Southern California. We moved down to San Diego where my grand, my mother's mom lived and, you know, grandparents. And so that's where my city was the 89, 90. I think we're about the same age, Jay. Right. Um, and so that, that's where I started. I all through grade school, all through uh, high school was grew up in San Diego. And mm -hmm. to answer your question specifically, why did I join the United States military? Man, I remember exactly when I wanted to be a SEAL. Like a lot of us do, that seed gets planted in us. And I was seven years old. It was 1992, bro. And I was standing on this hill watching these glow lights in San Diego Bay. And I asked my dad what they were. He said they were Navy SEALs training in the Bay. I know now they were SGT students training in the Bay, you know. But but then that, that world opened up to me and I was like, damn. So, you know, men with green faces, you know, all the, the Green Berets in Vietnam, SEALs in Vietnam, all that whole world was really calling to me you know when yeah. people were playing soldier in the canyons and out in the woods you know growing up i was playing for real man <laughs> you know, i was i was in it i was in it you know it was it was a, I, I knew that's where i was going to end up going you know and, and you know new ideas come in and out you know when you oh yeah but that was the general theme for me i got you so at what point did you make that transition uh from hey i'm going to go enlist and this is the route I'm going to take. Did, did you and your dad have that conversation? Did he try to sway you towards the Marine Corps? No, my dad, my dad was kind of, he had through his troubles, man, with drugs and alcohol growing up and he was in and out. You know, I, I had love and support from my family, but they had their marriage troubles, which mm -hmm. I understand now as a grown man, you know, what that side was like. And so he was gone a lot. It was a lot of, a little bit of a chaos. And so we never had that conversation. He never drove that. I, I was on my own with that. And through high school and all that, I knew I was going to be a Navy SEAL. Or that's what I wanted to do. But kind of where I grew up, it was you go to college, yeah. right? It was like, you go to college. My, my grandfather was a captain in the Navy, went to the Naval Academy, all that. And I was supposed to be an officer. Right. I was supposed to, my mom was horrified if I would have enlisted. She's like, what? You know? <laughs> and I, and, um, and so I was, I tried to go in the Naval Academy. I was actually prepped to play football in the Naval Academy. I was pretty good. I, I, I could ball and I played strong safety in, in high school and was kind of, it, that was happening in sophomore and junior year. That was developing other schools and stuff too, but I got kicked out of high school for possession of marijuana and some fights. So, <laughs> as you can imagine, the that whole Naval Academy thing disappeared, as well as all any other scholarship offers. Poof. Just pretty much overnight. So I went to, you know, the local other school, Rancho Bernardo, is actually where I graduated from, and kind of just started on this college path. You know, I went to a div division three school in Orange County failed right out. And I was not, you know, we, uh, during high school, I was going down to Mexico and shooting steroids and getting tat. I had was all tattooed by 16 years old, man. And, um, just still getting grades. I was still yeah. going to school and still, you know, still doing, I was working, you know, I did 
I was doing my thing, but definitely was not in any type of focus and no clear path. Uh, looking back, I was lost, man. And so getting into college, I went to multiple, started doing the wrong stuff, getting into drugs, selling drugs, doing drugs, and decided to move back east to Boston, where I was actually born, yeah. and moved into the basement of my aunt and uncle's house, and just kind of went into this isolation period, which I think is very important for guys who go into the, we those periods of isolation. And it was the best thing I had ever done. I got reset, went to junior college, trained in Muay Thai, lifting early and four in the morning, all that stuff, working landscaping jobs. And then finally I had enough credits, transferred back to University of California, Santa Cruz, a super left wing school, but it's the only place I got in. And now I was, starting to not live correct again. Mm -hmm. I started going out partying. I lost that discipline. The girls and the ego starts going up again. I had no more isolation and I still hadn't built a good system. I was way too immature and working at a bar, partying, getting arrested for multiple things, drunk in public, DUI, driving on suspended many times, seven or eight times in about 18 months. Yeah. Then I graduate and that, that later had arrived, right? That, that time. And I, and I was so oblivious to, I was just like, yeah, I'll go in the military. I walked into that recruiting office, an officer recruiter. And I go, Hey man, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm here. Let's do this. He's like, you have pending court cases, man. <laughs> he's like, he's like, dude, you are, you're totally not even touchable. And I said, okay. Now, now the real world starts c coming in on me. And I go, okay, well, I'll get this figured out. Well, it ended up being the lawyer and the judge and all that. And they tell him I'm going to the military. But I had done so many. I hadn't earned any type of just signing it off. So they sent me to jail for four months. So I went to jail in Santa Cruz County Jail, lockdown facility, 20, you know, no yard time. I didn't see the sun for four months. And, you know, all guys in there, all felonies and all that, 23 years old. And I'm walking out of the jail all, the day after Christmas. The day after Christmas, they let me go at midnight. And the guard asked me what I'm going to do. And I told him, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And he just fucking starts laughing at me. And rightfully so. I was delusional. I was so delusional. And I didn't realize the administrative mountain I was about to have to climb to unfuck myself. After all of those dumb decisions, it was, it was really like going to have to be some divine intervention to get me in. And I didn't understand that quite yet. So now we're going into recruiting offices. I tried, I was scared of failing SEAL training, Jay, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in San Diego, man, that's where Bud's is. I knew guys that had went from high school, a lot of good athletes and everybody failed. Everybody was in the Navy scraping paint undesignated after they failed out of buds. And so I wanted a gun and I wanted to deploy. So I thought the Marine Corps was going to be my best bet for that. I went into the Marine Corps. They said, no way. I have too many tattoos. They didn't, they have too much of a percentage of my body was tattooed. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I went into the army. I wanted to go Ranger or Green Beret, right? I was like, let's do it. Because the I was thought the I thought the Navy was going to be almost impossible with my background. Yeah. I thought that I might have a little bit better chance with the Army. And they said, absolutely not. They said, you can't, you can't, we can't even enlist you. You have too much of a checkered background. And I was like, oh no. Now, yeah, Jay. The Army turns you down. <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude, now, Jay. I go back to my mom. I'm living at my mom's house, dude. 23 years old, like loser. And I'm really realizing the reality of that. And I pretty much just rolled up, curled up in the fetal position for two, three days while I, now I started, the French Foreign Legion started to come on to my radar. Mm -hmm. I started researching like, okay, if I need to look red, grab red, you know, if I have to, I can do this. They'll take me. I'm pretty sure. But I had student loans and stuff. I couldn't just off up chalks. 
you know, and my mom had co-signed with me on loans. Like my parents didn't pay for college or my mom didn't. I, my mom's a teacher, you know, single mom. I, we didn't have money for that type of stuff. So everything was pretty much on me. So I couldn't just leave. So I go, okay. I went into the Navy recruiter with a piece of paper with all my court cases and dispositions. Everything was clear. Everything was good. It didn't look terrible. and It was only misdemeanors. And the guy said, okay, we can actually work with this but you can either be a seal or nothing pretty much like they, you know, that that's, if you can pass the screeners, they they're trying to get guys in better qualified candidates physically. If you can do this. Okay. But other than that, you really don't have, you can't, you can't be a corpsman. I couldn't do anything because I had drug charges and all that stuff. Yeah. So I started that process, Jay, you know, through MEX that was stressful for me, man. That was like, not good. I mean, they had the, you know, those, civilian contractors interviewing me and all these different places coming to my job. I was stacking boxes at Home Depot at night during this time. And I'm just, you know, they're interviewing me for five hours, asking me why there's so many holes in my story. It, it was stressful, but sure enough, I make it through MEPS. And now I'm in the Navy. So now I start this SEAL screener test. I can actually start screening. And it took me about nine months every week taking the test, getting my names wrapped up on that roster mm -hmm. and working out with the former and retired SEALs and current SEALs who were yeah. in that NSW wheelhouse of, of recruiting. And I, I needed to get some face time. You know, I needed letters of recommendation. I needed a lot of help. And I also needed to get in better shape. My running, I, I'm like, I'm my running, bro. I running's for the enemy. You know, that's what I always say, man. I, uh, you know, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, they see me, I'm down. That's like me, dude. You know? <laughs> I'm like, so I can, so I was hurting. I needed some help on the running. And I, so I was throwing up every day doing these long runs in Pendleton. The SEALs were taking us, the senior chief, he would just haul ass up in the mountains in Pendleton. And that's what I did, man. You know, at, for nine months, sure enough, one day they say, hey, you got your SEAL contract. And that's, that's when I shipped out in February, 2010. Yeah. So looking back at all of that stuff now, and this is a two part question, um, looking back at your initial uh, upbringing and the stuff that you went through, um, if you had any advice for the 17 year old fucking Taylor that's currently yeah. about to travel down the same path that you traveled, what advice would you have for him? And two, why do you think special operation, you know, like guys like us are so attracted and to that community, right? Because it's always the same story, dude. Everybody that I've interviewed, you know, checker pass, you know, single family household, grew mm -hmm. up a freaking menace to society, as I like to say it. But yet, those are the type of guys that, you know, like these communities want and need, right? Like, what do you think that is? Well, so it's a good question. The first part, what I would tell myself is, man, relax. You don't need to be out all the time. Focus work out, chill the fuck out. This is a long game. That's what I would tell myself. It doesn't matter what's happening on this weekend. What's happening in 10 years? You know, that's what I would tell myself. I don't know if myself would listen, but that's what I would tell myself, you know, and save your money. Don't spend it on dumb shit. You know, that's what I would say. I'd say nothing good happens after midnight. Get your rest. Get up early on that samurai, you know, rise at four, go to bed at, you know, when the sun goes down, you know, get on that samurai program and, and things will work out better for you. And you're, you're going to save yourself a lot of regret and pain, right? And that's, that's really the, what I would try to hammer into my 17 year old self. Now to answer your second question, why is that man? Cause we got warrior genes in us. We got that warrior gene and it's not everybody that has it. And so every person in society can't have it. It doesn't work like that. And so what's paired with that is self-destructive tendencies, that storm, you know, that, that a lot of that's that soft guys, every, I can say it and we all know what it is. There's that storm of wanting to mix it up. And we're, we're masters at risk management. You know, we want to push that envelope. And when we're young, we just don't have anywhere to push it to. 
You know, we're not in, we're not in a soft, you know, we're not in a platoon. We're not at a regiment. We're not, we're, so we, there, that outlet, if it's not sports, you know, that saves a lot of us, I think. But once sports are kind of pulled away, that there's a vacuum for chaos, you know, if it's not guided right. Now, that's why I think fathers in the home are extremely important. Disciplines, especially for guys like us. It's like having a, it's like having a pit bull, man. Like a, a pit bull just left to its own devices. People go, oh, they're, no, a pit bull not trained is a dangerous animal. It's a dangerous animal. And, it, and if it's left alone in the house, it's going to rip your walls apart, you know, because it's got that storm in it. It's a bred fighter. You can't unbreed that. So how do you combat it? You socialize it. You train it. You discipline it. And the dog's much happier when it's disciplined also because it's not stressed out. And so I think that that's a lot of us. We're that pit bull that needs to be trained and disciplined harshly, you know, harshly, not with a soft hand, because that's the only way we really understand. And unfortunately, we get that hard hand through our poor mistakes and poor decisions. Yeah, because I always joke, especially when I was, you know, um, active duty, like I would always uh, like one of the things that I love to do is coach, teach and mentor. And because at the end of the day, there's still guys that don't have that word gene that still make it through the cracks, right? And get to these regiments. Yeah, well, yeah. Essentially soft. Yeah. Right? Like I call them fucking soft. Mm -hmm. And these guys are put in charge. And I always tell guys, like, especially, you know, as the senior enlisted guy, I would always joke that, hey, at the end of the day, I'm in charge of, you know, 11 pit bulls, right? And I need to be able to manage those 11 fucking pit bulls. Because if I mm -hmm. don't, like they're gonna fucking run rapid and they're gonna destroy not yeah. only my team, they're gonna destroy themselves, they're gonna destroy the reputation of the regiment. So you you need a very strong leader to be able to manage super A type fucking like lunatics, as I call them, right? Because that's that's what you need. It is, dude. They did a study, man, of the guys on death row and special operators. I forget the study, and it was like the psychological profile is almost identical, almost identical. Two guys on death row. Why is that? That's, and I'm not saying I have an answer to it, but that's fascinating that all it takes is some little input somewhere along the line. We, and we got that input, most of us when we were kids, right? That special force seed got planted. We saw something somewhere and it just sunk. And th some of those guys on death row never got that input. You know, yeah. and so I'm yeah. grateful that we're really lucky that we got that because a lot of us would be <laughs> locked behind bars, you know, and some of us did both, you know, so, but it's, but it's, it's absolutely the truth that we need discipline, man. Like, yeah. and I know, you know, I can tell by your physique and stuff, we need discipline. Guys with that warrior gene, bro, we thrive on discipline. Yeah. And so if it's not structural around us, and if guys like in your group, or platoon or aren't instituting on themselves. Well, guess what? You have to institute it on them. But the best way is if, you know, and, and we learn this with age, unfortunately, you know, in my, in my, my late thirties, I'm just figuring it out. You know, I like just cracked the code on myself where I'm like, Oh, I just have to get up early as fuck mm -hmm. all the time. No matter what, stick to my macros. I, I have to discipline my entire fucking day or or I fill it with negative stuff. If I don't fill it with positive stuff, it's getting filled with negative stuff. And I that's agree. that's that's the secret is the discipline. And people don't like that word, but man, I'm so much happier when I'm disciplined, bro. So I have so much more inner peace and clarity when I'm disciplined in my day. I'm a I'm a totally different person, better energy, better for the people around me better for myself. I get more done. It's, yeah. it's a no brainer, but I'm, it's a shame that it takes some of us, me too, uh, not too late, but later. And I, and I wish that I had learned earlier. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause I always joke around too. Like the only, the biggest difference between, you know, us as soft operators and the guys that are locked up in, you know, death row is we woke up one morning, they went left, we went right. We went to yep. the fucking recruiting station. They went to go rob a bank, right? That's the only yeah. difference. No, 100%. Identical, identical individuals, right? Um, so now yeah. you get done with 
well, you 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 pass a sealed screening training, and now you're at bugs. Like, how did that whole process develop? Bugs, and then you getting yeah. So so it's kind of like it's kind of like your guys' 18x. I got that sealed challenge contract that they called it, and you go right in from the streets into the the, the special. Uh, NSW pipeline or not SW, but the special program pipeline. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, I, you start at the time they had special, uh, a special, not special force, but like a special program boot camp mm -hmm. in the regular boot camp. But we were just all grouped up. Mine was a hundred guys at Great Lakes, Illinois in Navy boot camp, but we were doing, we were, working out way harder. We had to learn all the Navy stuff, but our day was just structured different. So that's how that goes. And that was eight weeks. Actually pretty hard. They kicked the, they kicked the crap out of us, man. Those, some of those petty officers, because none of those guys are SEALs, you know, they don't know. So they're like, I've got all these SEAL candidates. Let's hammer them. And, and there's a lot of, out of that hundred, Jay, only nine guys made it. Oh, wow. Out of that original hundred from boot camp, right? That's way back. But we had a good boot camp, bro. I mean, out of those nine, five of those guys are operating at the tip of the spear right now, if you know what I'm saying. That's Still, awesome. like, yeah, so we, we had a solid crew, bro, like team leads out, uh, out of there, you know, so real solid. I was really fortunate and s some of my best friends still, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's really, that was, I felt fortunate when we got in in our boot camp. And then we went to Bud's Prep, which is across the street, which is just, it's like a, C school or, you know, it's that base or a school really mm -hmm. where, because there was no longer necessary for us to go do a different job and then come back to buds. It used to be like that in the Navy. I don't know how it was in the army, but probably similar, go, you know, go to the infantry and then, then come in. So we were just working out and that wasn't bad. It was kind of relaxed, but, and they had civilian contractors doing running, lifting, swimming every day, three sessions a day, two hours sessions. So six hours a day we were working out and then we did a final test out out of like, they had like a thousand guys or no, they had 600 guys. They take the top 75%, something like that. And then we flew out to Coronado with 400 guys pretty much. Mm -hmm. So, and that's when we started our class 284, Bud's class 284 in June of 2010. And about a hundred guys quit immediately just because they didn't want to be seals anymore, but they just want not, not, we hadn't even started training yet. It was just, they wanted to be in San Diego to get a different job, right? They didn't want to oh, reclass yeah. in, in Illinois. So they just kind of work in the system. They, they realized they didn't like working out and running and all that. So, um, so then we classed up and started with 285 in indoctrination. Three weeks later, we had 185 to start first phase. And then by the time three weeks later happened, we had about 50, 60 guys after hell week. So 400 to 60. And then we went through the rest of buds, graduated December, you know, 2010. And we had, you know, a handful of originals, I think like 10 or 15 or no, 15 about. And luckily I was one of them. And then we rolled into SQT. Gotcha. So from start to finish, uh, buds to SQT. Around what time did you graduate? S S SQT was it a 2011 time frame? Yeah, yeah. So I graduated July 2011. Same mm -hmm. SQT class 284, and that's a seven month process. We go uh, mountain warfare in Alaska for mm -hmm. a month in January. Then we roll right into marine operations, combat diving, a month. Then we roll into close quarters combat, a month, then land warfare, a month, then skydive cell, a month we do, we have, we start because army runs jumping, you know, so yeah. we start with static line and the art, you know, the army's overseeing all the jump protocols. We do a week of static line, get called up on that, on the Mexican border, man, bro, <laughs> there's guys, you know, you, you, have, you know, you've, we've all done static line and nobody, nobody yeah. enjoys static line, but bro, we would have guys because, you know, you can't – people that don't know, static line, it's not like a regular parachute. No. You can't steer it as you'd, as you'd like. You can kind of hope it goes a certain direction and kind of lead it that way, but it's not turning. And so we would have guys blow into Mexico, bro, <laughs> over the border wall. Dead serious. Dead serious. Over the border wall. And so they'd have to open it up and get the border patrol out there. And, you know, it wasn't happening a lot, but it did happen. Yeah. 
because it was that that was where our jump zone or drop zone was for that. And oh, yeah, dude. So then then we have three weeks of free fall, you know, and then working all the way up to Halo at night with with combat gear on nods and and, uh, and I mean, we might not even been using nods yet to be quite honest on the jumping, but yeah, man. And then a little bit of that low profile, low visibility operation stuff, you know, in, in urban environments, nothing too high speed, but learning how to move and how to, how to be in a, in a low visibility environment and then sear and then, you know, locked naked in a box, which we all know about for, for a week. And then, and then graduation, bro. Gotcha. Gotcha. So now from when you first started on that journey to graduation, like how are you feeling now? Are you, you know, disciplined? Is your mental uh, psyche a lot tougher? Like you literally transform yourself. Like how yeah. is it that you're feeling? That's a good question. And that's an important part because that's a lot of my message. So I had had a lot of checkered stuff, bro. When I had got into the pipeline finally, like in boot camp, dudes are miserable, bro. I was elated. I felt like I I was waking up like ping rise and shine bro at boot camp. I was so fucking happy. I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be doing. I'm not saying it wasn't hard, but I was it was I was so focused through buds like I was just resting on the weekends like sanding my helmet, getting everything ready for inspection on Monday. I was locked the fuck on. I had one kind of sketchy night after like a, you know our pool comp I passed and I'm like okay I can kind of and then I almost get you know blacked out and kind of almost could have gotten trouble and then I had one bad night in SQT where uh, we were almost about to graduate so I cut loose a little bit in Pacific Beach down by the beach and I did get arrested and I don't know if you, people know this but if you get arrested in the pipeline you're done there is no second chance if it's an alcohol-related incident, I don't know why I was risking it. Like, looking back, it was stupid. But I went out, and it wasn't me going out fighting and causing being that guy. I was just drunk as shit walking home. Like, that, I was black. It was like that. And the cops was like, hey, bro, I had it too many. That's why I didn't have any legal problems, because I was just blacked out walking home, probably stumbling. And the guy goes, hey, hop in the car. And he took me to a drunk tank where they don't process paperwork no, in no. San Diego. It's, it's just like a warehouse with bums. So it's me, a bunch of bums, <laughs> me, SQT student, about to be a SEAL, bunch of bums, and then he, I get out. But, I, dude, I, this is one thing I hit to all the guys, any younger guys out there, and fuck anybody older who's still going through this shit, man. The regret of, of that, like how terrible I felt, not with the hangover, but me going, is this going to kick back, right? I have to tell somebody about this. I'm not going to – so I told my, one of my leadership, and they're like, we're going to keep it quiet. Cause you're fucked, but if paperwork kicks back on this, you we're gonna slam you, right? That's what they said to me, and I don't wish that that feeling on my worst enemy. Dead serious, being so sad about my own choice, and we do it to ourselves. That's why it makes absolutely no no sense at all. We keep trying to find happiness in the same place we lose it, and I kept having problems, and I should you know should have cut it then but luckily enough it kind of passes over and now i'm graduating and now we're into the summer going to language school i went to arabic it was mandatory at the time and kind of loose now now we're now, but i'm still bro i'm working out i'm running the o course i'm getting ready to go to a seal team i don't know what i'm walking into you know i'm getting but i'm going to show up ready and so i was you know Make it, I was prepping my meals. I was pretty structured, and every once in a while I'd go out to the bar, but nothing crazy. I wasn't doing anything that wild. I was just really happy, man. Like you know how it is when you probably get yeah. your tap. It's like you, that. That's maybe one of the best times in life when you just graduate from that because life's still simple. Mm -hmm. Life, life's you're still in that simple. You that and you're riding that high of just having finished that pipeline. It was a great time, really, and I was. And I'm grateful for having experienced that. But I was pretty focused and in a very good space mentally. Yeah. Now, going through all that training, um, here's a question. And again, I, I think the folks that are getting ready to travel the same path that you travel, whether it's a, 
uh, well, buds and then SQT and then on my side, um, selection and then the Q force. Mm-hmm. As far as mental prep, what did you do to get your mindset ready for that subfest that you were about to uh, in, embark on? Because you mentioned that, yeah, you were pretty happy to be there because life had just beaten you down leading up to that point. Did that play a big factor in it? Man, I had given myself no plan B. I had nowhere else to go. That's what the story I told myself. Whether that was reality or not, it didn't matter. It was my reality. Because Hayes Hayes Gray and Underway was not an option for me. I was not doing that. So take that how you want it. I was not doing that, right? I would have not stayed in the military and done that. And I would have gone to the French Foreign Legion. I would have left, you know, I, I, there was no, so I was terrified of things out of my control. I was so worried about getting injured. I was very aware, you know, where I was stepping. I was hyper aware of that stuff and stuff that you can fail. I was stressed the fuck out, you know, every run, you got to remember, I passed every run by like 10 seconds serious all the way through and maybe the last couple runs I was getting okay better times but all through buds 10 seconds left I had to put out puking at the end of every single run and in the goon squad on every conditioning run wet and sandy and but there was I people go oh if you didn't think about quitting you're lying fucking bullshit man I never thought about quitting not once every step I thought about how much this sucks but I never was like, oh, because I could have went to my mom's house, bro. My mom's house right up the street from Bud. You know, I had a nice warm place. I could have run and hide. But that wasn't an option, man, because I knew what would happen that ne- what that would feel like that next morning. Yeah. So yeah. to, to mentally, mental preparation was that I had put myself through so much self-induced suffering that and realized that I didn't have a lot of options, man. I didn't. I had debt stacked. I couldn't even be in the regular military and afford it. That's one thing because my student loans were so massive. I, I was, and I just, I, so I had, the story I had said was it's this or it or nothing, you know? So I was fully invested. Yeah. And I always tell people this, you know, when they, you know, reach out to me, cause I'll try to, you know, coach and mentor some of these younger guys. And I tell them, you know, because they call me with a plan B in mind. It was like, yeah, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to do I'm like, dude, you have a plan B already. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you're not. You're because setting yourself up for failure. Really fucking nice, right? Plan B is going to sound real nice once you're getting kicked in the balls. You know what I mean? The best. It'll sound, it will, you'll, you'll immediately just go, yep, already have that set up. Yeah, yeah. So now you get through, um. Uh, SQT, you get through language, and now were you an East Coast or a West Coast uh, SEAL? Yeah, I went West Coast. So I asked for, I had asked for West Coast and third phase when they asked us. I wanted to stay in San Diego, man. You know, that's where I'm from, and that's just my vibe. And so I was sent, I was given orders to SEAL Team 7, where actually that's where I wanted to be. Nice. So now you're in the SEAL teams. How did everything develop? Um, like, are you enjoying yourself? Now you're a fucking badass. Like, how did everything develop, and how did that lead to you? So the climate at the team was good. The guys, but, but serious, right? As, as like, dude, you hit the wave. You were in, you know, 03, 04. You know, I looked up your bio, Jay. It's impressive what you've done, man. You were right in there. So imagine like you having those five, six years in, you know, oh, yeah, you know, in the full, full spectrum of warfare at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Then I'm showing up and these guys are coming back from a, another deployment 11 months in Afghanistan. So there was no room for bullshit. There was no sketch. There was no, they didn't even have time to haze. It was like all, if you, we're not even going to deal with you if you can't perform. So I showed up. I was first there. I was last to go. I was, I volunteered for comm school right away because I knew everybody hated it. And that really helped me out because I ended up being, people started taking notice and I started getting some, you know, I kept my mouth shut and I stayed working and, and I fucking loved it. I could not have been, I wanted to be there. 
I had no, that was my world, bro. You know what that's like, Jay? It's it's yeah. your whole entire earth revolves around the team room and the platoon space and and so I was really happy, man. And so any school, anything came up, I just rogered up for it. So I, I went to comm school, came back. Then the, it was this January 1st. These guys are just coming back from Afghanistan. And they go, we don't have anybody to go to JSTAC school. So we need a comms guy who's got, who wants to go to, but no, all the guys are on vacation. So I said, I'll go. And they sent me to JTAC. So I went up to Fallon, Nevada, got my JTAC call up uh, mm -hmm. where the, for where the guys don't know, that's um, where they have the Top Gun school. And one of my boys that I was in a seal with, who's still operating now, the tip of the spear, his brother was the Top Gun instructor. He was a badass, you know, F-18. I knew I, I, it was like everything was synergizing. And I loved it, man. The autonomy, just govern, you know, you make your own trips. You're scheduling your own hotel. You're we were scheduling my own. And I was by myself. It was just autonomy as a new guy getting an SUV and a, hotel room for a month and I could not have been happier. I just wanted to work. I just wanted to go to the, I just knew I was right in my wheelhouse. Came back, they go, we need guy who's a comms guy and a JTAC to go to sniper school. And they go, you got to shoot off. And the new older guys were not happy with that, bro. <laughs> they were not happy with that, as you can imagine. Cause there's guys coming back from AFG going, yeah. This motherfucker's stepping over me. You know, obviously we had to shoot off. They weren't going to give it to yeah. me. So we went to the shoot off. I passed. I beat some of those guys. They were not happy about me getting racked and stacked, but that's how it's business, man. So I got sent to, I was scheduled to go to sniper school, which I, I ended up going and graduating. Mm -hmm. But, but before that, we get a call to go to Mexico to go to the G20 summit to protect the president. Okay. And I'm a new guy and they need a comms JTAC. So I get picked up out of like five guys to do this Marine extraction force. We're that, we were that exterior ring, Jay. You know, we weren't the interior team. We drew the short straw and team eight got the good straw and was on the land in Cabo. I was, we were on the, an LCU floating back and forth next to Obama's, Obama's little mansion he had rented and they were worried about the cartels. This was 2012. Yeah. Uh, and so I almost died there. I, I went in the drink full kit and actually in a storm, like two miles out to sea and almost died. That was the closest I've ever come to dying was on that simple Cabo trip as a new guy. Didn't have the right, didn't even put flotation. It had a water wing. Thought I'd be good. Thought I'd be chill. And then we get a huge storm. I have to jump onto a swick boat and miss, go right in the drink, full kit, seven mags, M4 wired into my kit, nods, helmet, backpack, radios, batteries, kicks, uh, everything you could possibly imagine I had on me and I was heavy, bro. And I was treading water and I almost died. But past that, we get past that, but that, that lesson taught me that we weren't playing anymore. It wasn't training anymore. It's, it was on me to keep myself alive. There, it wasn't time out in the, the ambulances behind you. It was a, it was an eye opener and I'm really happy it happened there and not in combat or something crazy because I go, Holy shit, man, nobody's watching out for me except me. And I'm talking gear and all that stuff. Like it is big boy rules. No one's walking up to you, making sure you got your flotation in there. You see your two cartridge in your fucking water wings. It's on you, bro. And I, and I go, okay, this is big boy rules. Like this is no longer joking around. And uh, so that was a big lesson for me on that that I took away. And, and now we're rolling in the summer and I go to sniper school, bro. Nice. Now, did you do sniper school? Did you come to brag for sniper school or do you guys have your own? Yeah, we had Atterbury, Indiana. They have an NSW sniper school. You know, we, nice. go, to the pick, we go to the pick stuff for a couple of weeks and then we go, uh, I think it, I believe it was nine or 10 weeks or something like that in Atterbury, Indiana. They got good stock fields in the woods and stuff out there. It's on like a National Guard base. Yeah, I gotcha. And then there's like, yeah, and then it's like uh, we have a, like a own little compound. Gotcha, dude. It sounds like you were doing fucking awesome shit, just crushing it all the way around. Dude, I was the golden boy, you know, dude. And yeah. that's and that was that was part of the problem, Jay's, yeah. because I was that. As happens, you know, we go through these times of expansion mm -hmm. and get a little ahead of our skis, start drinking our own Kool Aid, 
and this was in my case at least, and start leaning into it a little too much and forgetting the disciplines that got us to that point to be hitting that. And I was, I thought I was keeping the disciplines, but things were getting a little looser. I was partying a little harder. I was getting a little more cocky. I was, and if you don't humble yourself, the universe will humble you. And that's what happened to me, bro. Coming, you know, coming up later, the early promotes and all this shit. Had a, we had a good deployment to Yemen. In between that, or right after, not hot combat, but we were doing PSD for the ambassador and the Houthis were kind of doing their thing at the time, training the counter, some FID, stuff like that, building out the FOB, you know, growing a beard and getting weird, bro. It was just eight of us kind of left to our own devices. It was yeah. not a bad, dude, I loved it. Man, being in, living in a tent, eight months, I fucking loved it, bro. I I knew I was right where I was supposed to be, and it felt yeah. good, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that, man, because, like, once you're there and you're doing all this cool shit, like, you are top of the food chain, right? Everybody wants to fuck you. Dudes can't really fuck with you. That's not within your circle. Like, you yeah. are just that dude, and you can easily go down the wrong path and that's one of the reasons why I started my channel because I was there and I, I see guys, like I know how easy it is for guys to fall into that. So I'm like, Hey man, like from someone that's been there, you're going to be faced with this, right? Do the best that you can to not travel down that path or else it will end your career. Right? So now I'm eager. Bro, that gives, that gives me the, it gives me the chills, bro. When you yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm eager to hear how, your career developed and how that led to you leaving and what guys can learn from it right because again someone mm -hmm. out there right now like everything that i talk about i'm like dude whether i believe it or not like someone right there out there right now is getting ready to do the same fucking shit right yeah and maybe the night story can change that right yeah and and as i think back to that time when I got back from my first deployment and I get arrested almost immediately. Another time drunk downtown slammed on the ground by the cops. No, no charges filed, nothing. Right. Again, slipped through the cracks and didn't take heed. And what is it? All these signs. That's, that's what guys can take from this is you should start recognizing the signs. The universe will start sending you signs if you're not living right. It will start. It will start small, and then there will be another thing. Man, if you get that net, that other thing, you better stop what you're fucking doing. Take that tactical pause. Hit that sills, and stay home. Think about what you're doing. And I always say this: take an inventory of your life, self inventory. What am I doing now? Write it down. Literally, write it on a piece of paper. What is my day looking like? And once you see it in black and white, you're like, oh, at the bar, 10 hours on Saturday. You know, like, is that, and then circle the things that aren't getting you to your desired goal and then subtract them. Take them out because they are only going to divert you. If it's not benefiting you, it's hurting you. Get serious, especially guys going into a soft pipeline. This is not fucking around. It's not, it's not even just your life. Like some people who are out and maybe playing sports, it's not even just your life, man. This is other people's lives too. Other people depend on you. You're, you, you're taking up quals and spots and stuff that if you do something stupid, now you're out of the fight. And now all these gaps have to get filled and you it's mission readiness is fucked because of you. I'm not saying every guy's the most important thing, but it can't be replaced because they can, but it's not I, optimal for the team. And aren't you trying to be optimal for the team? So think and once you, if I would have thought outside of myself for one second and been like, it's not what I want to do. I want to go party. I want to go see this chick. I, 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 man, go fuck me for a second. What is best for the team? If, if you start thinking that way, your life is going to go way better. Your career is going to go way better. So for me, I remember in 2004, we had just gotten back from a trip from Iraq and uh, we were out just partying, having a good old time. And we went down to the bar and uh, my buddy got into a fight and out of nowhere, a cop came to break up the fight. Right. And the cop grabbed him, slammed him to the ground. 
So me and I thinking straight, you know, these are my my buddies. We just gotten back from Afghanistan. We just gotten back from fighting. I take the cop and I slam him down. And of course, he hit me up and I got thrown in jail, right? That was my wake up call that, hey, the universe is telling me that I need to get something together. I need to get my shit together or it's going to get a lot worse, right? So, but I was smart enough to figure that out at a very young age. Like, hey, if I don't get help, something's going to go dramatically wrong. Well, you're smart as you're smart as shit to recognize that, bro, because that could have, you know, that's serious. And that's how fast it happens. People don't realize you were reacting out of pure reaction. That as a as a pipe hitter, guy grabs your buddy, you grab him. Doesn't matter if he's got a uniform on or not. And that's where it gets dangerous. Yeah. So you're in the SEAL teams, you're having a good old time, you're crushing it, you're the golden boy. So what happened that led to all of this crashing down that led to all of it ending. So, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of bump up through this. What happened these next two years is I'm riding that, that, that leaning two forward. I go on a JTAC trip. I hit a guy in a bar, right? One time. And I always say, bro, that's all it takes. Broke the guy's orbital eye socket. I get an aggravated assault charge, grave bodily injury charge. So they're charging me with six years. I went to jail. Six years plus three is my deal. I get I get sued for a quarter million dollars by the guy also. And I'm fighting this. I get pulled out of the platoon, fighting this case. They delay it. The team writes me a letter. The court gives me permission to deploy to Iraq while I'm out on bail. So I'm out on bail. They send me to Iraq while I'm sitting there stressing on this whole deployment. That was a dark deployment for me, but we're in like, Northern Iraq kind of prepping for that Missoula offensive, you know, building out a new fob, meeting up with the Sunni tribal fighters, doing that whole thing. And I'm stressing about going back because I have a felony court case I'm fighting. End up coming back, dealing with that, getting it kind of squared away. I get put on formal probation, real formal, getting checked for alcohol, drugs by the state. And it was very hectic. But I get my top secret clearance back after having it taken away. And I'm good for like a month or two. And then, boom, I get another altercation about three months later with um, at, a con you know, at a concert. And that was the nail in the coffin for me. So now this last accident took place. Is that when you knew that it was all over for you? Sitting in jail, yeah, sitting in jail that time, I knew I was toast, right? I knew I was toast, and it was going to be, and that was no fun, so I had to go. So I went to jail for that first thing, active duty. I went on vacation, went to jail, got out, went right back to training. Very crazy, and then I get in trouble again. Now I'm in jail again. Now it's finished. I get processed out, fight. The team was pretty good with me. I get a general discharge, go to jail, walk out. Sign my DD-214, and I'm out. No reserve time. I mean, I'm clean out, and I'm working in the civilian world for two years. I started with a real estate development company, doing on a pretty big project. I know you're in real estate a little bit, Jay. So real estate's fascinating to me. I was really lucky, worked some contacts, and had some good mentors. I get into this job. Bro, I start stacking bad habits immediately. Alcohol, Xanax, weed. Adderall every day, everything, and still working and getting success. And that was the problem, just like in the teams. I could touch my success. People can look and go, oh, he looks like from the outside, and I could lie to myself too. I'm going, I'm still going to the gym. I still look decent, but I'm doing all these bad things all day long. And it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. You can't bend reality for that long without getting slamming on your face. I ended up leaving that job, going in the cannabis industry. We launched a company in because in, uh, it was the first year it was legal in California. I'm the CEO of this company. I'm pitching decks. I'm raising millions. We're selling and I'm building out facilities and doing all this shit again. Now I'm in a high rise working for a venture capitalist. I'm the big cheese and I, my ego's just going up. And now I stack on an opioid habit on top of it. <sighs> Bro, I crashed and burned hard, literally did a line flat on my face, that was done, 
that whole thing, that was two years to the day when I got out of the military to where I literally fell on my face after two years of just running hard and lying to myself going, look what I'm doing. Obviously what I'm doing is right, but it was, the world will show you if you're living right or not. And that was my thing. And I went face down, bro. And then after that, I had a three month period of losing everything. You know, girlfriend gone, job gone, house gone, no, everything gone, man. And my world shattered. And now we're getting to the point where I start thinking about the foreign legion. I'm homeless in my truck on, in the jungle in Hawaii because I moved out there to get away from it on the big island, kind of like a lower, it's not like, it's just deep jungles. It's, uh, there's nothing out there, very rural. And man, I'm sitting there with a sawed off shotgun on my lap thinking about ending it. Seriously, I was, I was, everything was finally falling on me where I had nothing else to point to and say, I'm doing good. I had no more job, no more money, no more beautiful girlfriend, nothing, no more title. Yeah. Now the, that having lost my whole dream was starting to sink in. And I just had that moment realization. I call it God or higher consciousness or whatever you want to say said, Hey, stop being a fucking pussy. All you're thinking about is yourself, not your mom, your sister, your family or friends. I had team guys trying to get a hold of me. I just cut my phone. You know, I'm just like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm too just selfishly depressed pity party that I'm living in and I decide fuck this I'm going to the French Foreign Legion so you're going through this defeat you're sitting in your car you have that shotgun in your lap thinking about ending it all however you were able to turn it around you were able to pull yourself out of it and then go down to you know uh, France and you know did work joined the Legion how were you able to get out of it and what advice would you have for the you know, Taylor Kavanaugh that's currently going through that situation right now, sitting in the truck, thinking about ending it all. Stop thinking about yourself for one second. Think, I know it's hard to do. It's almost impossible. But step outside of yourself and go, what would I do if I just wanted to be good for my family? Even if I don't feel good right now. I just make them proud. That's one step. Now start moving. Start making a plan. It doesn't have to be perfect, but pick something and go, I'm going to do this and start working towards it and say, because we need purpose, man. Guys like us, we need purpose and it has to be hard. And for us now in the, it's like the business world. It's like, now we have, now we have a different battlefield. It's a co competition. We need it, man. And so if, if we're not, have no purpose it's that's why it gets dangerous for guys like us it is that's why we have such a problem in our communities because guys get out and they are no longer that guy and they can't point to it mine always is help guys you know the mentoring that if we need to be outside of ourselves and that's why that bigger scope for the team for country for all that we, we thrive in those scenarios okay now we're in the civilian world now it's for the people in your life now it's for the people in your community. What be that guy that people depend on? What turn into that guy? What guy do you admire? Now start building that guy. Get back to the discipline. Get get out of the head. Get back into the body. Start working out. Turn yourself into a savage again. Don't get soft. That that's immediately because my I started losing my discipline and not working. I know I was still kind of going, but all the discipline was gone. Once I start losing that, my mental health starts going away. I need to be locked the fuck on physically for me to be mentally sound. And I think that, that that hurts guys too. They start drinking, they get lazy, start eating whatever, and that's dangerous. So you decide to go down there. Did you speak French at all? Not a lick, bro. Not a, I, I, I googled, je suis ici pour la Legion right before I went in. So you decide to join the Legion. How did you go about joining? Yeah, so we'll get into the good stuff now. We'll get into some interesting stuff now because now it gets into kind of a unique story that nobody else has because it's hard to find information. You know, I was sleeping in a hostel, Googling my phone, sipping on a bottle of vodka, just letting the Adderall and the weed burn out of my system because I knew I was getting drug tested. But you can join in two spots. 
really. There, there's some satellite locations on the border of France, but those are just recuperation points. They're not pre-selection centers. You go to a pre-selection center in Oban or Paris. I chose Paris. And you take your little train, and it's just it, – it's fascinating. You just go knock on this big iron wood door with your bag and give them your passport, and that's how it starts. So for those that don't know exactly – what the French Foreign Legion is, in your own word, please describe what the Legion actually is. It was the French Foreign Legion was started by an old king about 200 years ago. And he had foreigners from a previous war where that France had fought in that he wanted to get out of the streets, causing problems in the bars, <laughs> back onto the battlefield for new wars. So he started the French Foreign Legion, and the carrot was if they served their time, they would get French citizenship. It's kind of like the old Roman legions where they could get French citizenship if they did their 17, you know, similar, similar type process. And that worked. It got all these guys out of the streets causing problems, that warrior gene, and back onto the battlefield. And so when guys died, it wasn't French citizens dying also. And so they always would send the Foreign Legion in. It's kind of cannon fodder. They fought in every war you can imagine from 18, from Algeria in 1800s to Afghanistan. Yeah, those dudes are everywhere, man. I remember I was deployed to Tajikistan. I ran into a couple of them there. And most recently, I was in Jordan on an actual deployment, and I actually ran into some of those dudes in Jordan, right? So I know those guys are everywhere. Yeah. Dude, France has got they France is spread out, man, and the Legion spread out. The Legion is seven or eight thousand guys, and it's it's I would say the ambiance is kind of like the Marine Corps. Very strict, very kind of like you know, in that sense, presentation long every time you walk into a room. It's very, very structured, and it needs to be, because you got all these guys coming from God knows where and with checkered backgrounds, they need to be, it's kind of like a prison, man. Very strict movement and autonomy. It's one-stop shop. It has its own cavalry. It has its own parachute. It has its own mountain warfare, mountain infantry group, engineers, own cooks, everything. It's a one-stop shop. So it's, they don't outsource anything. They have own infantry and their own little commando groups. So I'm somewhat familiar with the Legion. Like I've heard a couple of stories. I heard you guys are like second-class citizens. So how are you guys treated, right? Because I know you're not a French citizen, how were you guys treated within the Legion? It we're kind of the redheaded stepchild, right? We're kind of the redheaded stepchild as far as funding, like the, the French arm, French, but it's getting more integrated into the French military legally. And they do that for a lot of problems they had with hazing and discipline. And the Legion has had a lot of guys die, you know, getting buried up to their neck into the desert for, they're very strict on the discipline and they still break some rules. You know, they have little jails on every regiment. It's technically illegal, but they still do it. It's hush hush. It's not looked down upon because the guy, you know, the guy, the French, we deployed to Estonia on the Russian border doing with NATO, and we were attached with the French unit. The Legion always attaches, and they're great with it. They love us, man, because the Legion, we're just, we're treated so rough that when we're with the French military, it's like plush. You know, it's, it's like, Man, this is great. You know, it's they. It's so we, we, the culture you're brought up pretty stark. The bases are very rough. They don't give you a lot of comfort items. You're and you are happy when you get something good. And so generally, the French military likes working with us because it's very disciplined. Guys are shut. Guys shut the fuck up. It's very strict because it's. They put the fear of God in us, man, because they can make at the Legion, they can make your life miserable if you step out of line. So you joined the Legion for a reason, trying to find your way back. Did you get what you were looking for? Did joining the Legion solve the problem that it was supposed to serve for you? I'll tell you what it did, man. I, I went into the Legion with a very specific goal. I didn't go in there to go be Rambo and to get all this experience. I felt like I had it. And I knew I wasn't going to get better than where I came from. You know, I wasn't going to be shooting like I was. I knew that going in. I was very realistic. I needed time to burn. I needed, I wanted to finish all my tattoos and not be bothered. I had a vision for my body and I had a vision of who I wanted to be. 
and write a good story, an interesting story. I wanted to stack my resume a little bit. You know, and I did. I hadn't heard of anybody being a Navy SEAL legionnaire. I was like, I'm gonna do that shit. So that was my next hard thing, and it gave me something to focus on. But really, my identity got. I it gave me time to find my identity, because now I, once I started instituting my own discipline on myself, even more so than the Legion was. You know, they set my wake up time at 5:30. I get up at 3:30. I'm working out in the bathroom, and you know, I'm like. I looked at it like a prison sentence, isolation. I needed it. Start thinking about philosophy. Time to think that I hadn't let myself just sit, shut the fuck up and think and stop acting like a fucking ego mani maniac. I was cleaning toilets, bro. I was working in the kitchen, man, as a new guy, like all the way at the bottom, baptism and humility. And I needed it, man. And it took me about two, three years to where I start, my confidence started getting back. And then I start, then something clicked and I haven't looked back since because I realized it's on me. I don't need the Legion. I don't need anywhere. I can, I'm good if I institute my own systems on myself. And that's why I was really happy that the Legion gave me the time to figure that out. So you've had this incredible story, man, going from being a SEAL and now joining the Legion. What's next for you and how much longer do you have? Uh, within the French Four Legion? Are you coming to the States or are you hanging out in France? 30 missions. So, and I had a great deployment to South America in the jungle with them. That's pretty crazy. We could talk about sometime, but those jungle operations down there doing the gold mine stuff was wild, bro. And um, so I had good, op really good experience. I look back on it, but I feel, you know, you might come across, I'm, I feel good about what I've done. You know, I just kind of feel, I go, you know what? I tried for the commando group here. I failed one of the runs and bro, I was 37 going through it. And I'm like, pretty good. Dude. I was like, bro, my running days, they were never in front of me and they're definitely behind me, dude. I, I was like putting out Brandon. I just, I couldn't make the time. So I just, I took it as, okay. I, I pushed this about as far as I can go. I'm 38 now. So I pushed this as far as I can go to where I actually, I feel really pleased with what I've done and I'm ready for that next step. And so I started on this process of because, man, I had to heal myself. I was so hurt and wrong, living wrong for so long. And I, once I learned just some basic principles and systems, I really felt it, important to teach other people this. And there's so many people hurting out there. Not to be cliche like, oh, people hurting out there and they need help. No, man. People just don't have the correct information and they need some fucking discipline instituted on them and their life will be better and their family's lives will be better. It's very simple. It's track your macros. It's get up early. It's supplement correctly. It's some basic stuff and it's hold yourself accountable. But people just don't do it and things are, get, like you said, things are getting too soft. We need to bring it back and a lot of the mental health issues, a lot of the issues we're seeing in society are because Things are getting too easy. And because they're too easy, we have to be harder on ourselves. I mean, I'll pop, you know, I'm probably going to split time, man. I'm, uh, I want to, you know, start this company. So I'm on, uh, you know, this coaching deal. I'm on Instagram, TCAV official. I'm on TCAV TV, my YouTube. Time is getting the message out and starting some projects, you know, dude. So starting some interesting projects on the side we got going on. I'm excited to kind of see where this goes, you know, the path illuminates as you walk on it. So I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I know coaching is going to be a big part of it. My website's coming out on December 1st, tcavofficial.com and we're going to be we're going to be pushing this message, man. We're going to be pushing this message on how to live right and how to be good for your family, how to be better men and women who want to get their get leveled up and it's simple stuff. It doesn't have to be crazy, crazy stuff. I don't like spending hours in the gym, man. I'm not going to do content on how to curl. That's not interesting to me. You know, it's let's, let's really dig into it because the body and mind have to be in tandem. You're not going to see some fat motherfucker who's mentally sound. It's not possible. And just like you're going to not going to see some, some huge jacked guy who hasn't also dove in mentally to learn himself. It's you, you got to have both. Yep. So Instagram is the fastest, easiest way to get me. T cab official. And you can DM me. I'm Johnny on the spot with that. I answer all my DMS. You can get me on YouTube T cab TV and all my contact information for emails and all that's on. There.
Yeah, likewise. Likewise, Jay. Okay.